my mom told me that my entire my entire adult life and, and you know young teenager uh, life she was continuously praying for my safety right and she told me when I got out of prison that the only time I felt so freaking bad she told me that the only time that she felt that that prayer was answered and that I was safe was when I was in prison. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, founder of Be Better Media and a mom of four, passionate about human connection. Throughout my journey, I have experienced many What I Meant to Say moments. But since life doesn't give us do-overs, I've created a space to reflect and tell our stories again with a little more grace for ourselves and the hope that we can help others and be better for having listened. Welcome to What I Meant to Say. I'm your host, Wendy Jones, and I'm here today with Michael O'Dell, a former Marine and current um, intake coordinator for um, Warriors Heart, which is a, a, a nonprofit out of Texas that is there to serve veterans and first responders and active military for um, the, the suicide crisis and the addiction problems and the, the heartbreak that comes post um, military service. And Mike, I'm so excited to get your story today and just connect with you because um, the work you do is so, so important. So thank you for being here. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah. Um, so tell me a little bit about your background and how you became a Marine and a little about, you know, what led you to to that life? Okay. Yeah. So, so I grew up I guess, you know, I, I grew up in Bandera, which is where Warriors Hearts actually located. So this is my hometown where I'm at. And um, I have a lot of family that uh, have served in the military, Marine Corps, uh, Army, um, Navy, even my grandfather was uh, in the Navy. Um, and uh, so military runs in my family, right? So it, it runs pretty deep. And um, as a kid, though, I never had any real desire to uh to join the military i was just kind of doing my own thing like riding skateboards and playing baseball and you know kind of just uh going with whatever i wanted to do um and when i was when i was 19 uh that's that's when i decided to make a change in my life i had been going through so my in my teenager years i i had been going through quite a bit of things as well um like when i was 13 i started drinking like you know i don't know i guess i, I don't know if it's common or not but like I, it, to think that like a 13 year old had started drinking alcohol is just like crazy you know and i know teenagers right they go they do they do their thing um but i think for most people it's like you know, a kid 13, 14, or even 15, they, they might have had alcohol once or twice, but they are not drinking alcohol, you know? And yeah. but me, I was drinking alcohol. I, 13 years old, I fell in love with it. And do you remember, do you remember what it was that, that feeling, even at such a young age, because you're right, that it is, it's alarming to a lot of people, but I also know it's, it's very common. Do you remember what, what it was the feeling that that made you keep coming back yeah i i do and it took a long time to like reflect back on that to really like understand it because you know i forgot a lot of things but mm -hmm. um but after a lot of healing and a lot of reflection and i i did identify that uh when i was a young teenager i was depressed and i was not happy um, and I had a good life, right? Like I had a good life. Um, so it wasn't, you know, it wasn't that I had a, a bad life that made me depressed. You know, my, my parents are great. I got brothers, tons of friends, like I had a good life. Um, but for whatever reason, I was not happy with myself. And so, um, when I had that first drink, I remember we stole it out of my friend's fridge, my friend's parents' refrigerator. We went running down into the woods. And uh, he took a sip of the of the beer and was like, this is disgusting, didn't like it. I took a sip of the one I had and I drank the whole thing. And then I drank his and it, it changed the way that I was feeling about myself. 
and uh, you know, it ultimately comes down to I had a hole in my heart that I couldn't fill, uh, that I, I didn't know how to fill, and so I was I alcohol filled that void for me uh, at such a young age, and so so that's when it really started. It, it was I was unhappy, and alcohol changed how I felt about myself. It kind of made me feel kind of made me feel um grown right like that was one thing like it made me feel like i was an adult it made me feel responsible and it's crazy like alcohol making someone feel responsible but it did because it like it just felt like it elevated me to the higher levels in life even though i was still such a young kid like at ninth grade you know yeah and uh yeah that's what it was it was uh just wasn't happy with myself yeah and that mask, that mask that that alcohol, you know, or drugs, anything that alters our state like that can put on um, and change us, but not obviously for the long term, not for the better. And that I know winds into your story. So from from having that addiction um, inclination early, and then making your way to the military, how did that how did that come to pass? Yeah. So. Uh, um... I'll back up just a little bit. So I quit high school a couple times, right? So I struggled. Mm. Uh, I was drinking as a teenager and it, and it was not good. Uh, I, I was failing in school. I, so I quit school. I got a job when I was 15, right? And then I had my own money. So then I'm, I'm buying weed and I'm buying whiskey and I'm really living the life of like a 21 to 25 year old alcoholic drug addict, but I was 15, 16 years old. It was crazy. And, um, and I had been arrested numerous times, uh, at a young age, um, for, I just, just, I got caught a lot. And, um, and it, that, that in itself too was, um, it wasn't, I didn't enjoy going to jail, right? Mm -hmm. But I also was kind of on a mission to get a response out of people and that got responses out of people. So like if I went to jail, then like people cared about me. That's what I felt like, like people cared about me. People wanted to help me. People were worried about me, but so I wasn't worried about and I wasn't trying to hide anything either. Right. Mm -hmm. Like, so I was getting caught all the time. And so, so that went on. Uh, I eventually did go back, uh, when I was 18 years old, I went back to high school. I got my, uh, got my diploma. I like, I had this like light bulb come on. Like I'm better than what I'm like, than the way that I'm living, you know, like I can do great things. I just don't know how. So I went back to high school. And they put me in the library. This is super cool. They put me in the library. I failed every class up until this point. And uh, they put me in the library on this program where I could do my own work on a computer. And I did all four years of high school in like one full one full year and then a semester. So oh, I, I did my. it that fast, right? When I was actually dedicated and I wanted to succeed, right? And that's the same type of attitude I put into my addiction, right? Like I uh, wanted to drink and I wanted to drug. And so I, I mean, I did it, you know? And uh, so I got my diploma. And then when I was 19, I decided, so I, I did not get accepted into college because I had like a point, point eight two GPA or something, you know, ridiculous. So there's no way I was going to get into college unless I did community college or whatever but uh, so that's when I decided to join the military I went to the recruiting station in Kerrville Texas uh, I walked in there the army was trying to recruit me I I didn't want to join the army and then I walked by the Marine Corps uh, recruiting office and uh, the Marine Corps recruiter got me and uh, and that's when I so that's when I joined the Marine Corps was when I was 19 and I did it because I knew that I I wanted to, I wanted to be successful. I wanted to be something folks could be proud of like my family and loved ones, you know, and I, 
and I love helping people. Like what better way to, to like make people proud and help people than join the freaking Marine Corps and serve our country. Like that's, so that's why, I, that's why I did it. Uh, and caveat, um, I also got released from probation if I joined active duty, <laughs> active duty service. So there was the, I was on probation. So there was the, the pieces of, I want to be better. I want to grow. I want to make people proud. But then it was also like, if I, if I do this, I, I get out of a lot of trouble that I was in too. So there was, it was just a bunch of winning situations that led me to the Marine Corps. Yeah. I mean, almost like getting a clean slate, right. And a, a fresh start. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And at 19, so how long, um, how long were you in the Marine Corps? Um, yeah, so I served for four years, um, and uh, there's a there's a whole story as to why it was only four years, right? We only right. four years is a long time still. Yeah. Uh, but yeah, I joined uh, at 19 in 2006, and then I got out of the Marines in 2010. Okay, and were you were you deployed in that time? Yeah, so um, I I joined, went to boot camp, all the training and stuff like that. That was like six, seven months total, something like that, eight months. And then I found my duty station in Hawaii. So that was really cool. Like my life, I swear, my life is filled with like, just, I feel like what I feel like is things that don't normally happen to other people, you know? Yeah. <laughs> so, yeah. uh, and I think there's a lot of truth to that, but I, I know anyway, um, like, so I got out of 130 something Marines, they sent me to Hawaii by myself. Wow. All of, all of the other Marines got Camp Lejeune or Camp Pendleton or uh, even Okinawa, Japan. Uh, but I got Hawaii. It's like, well, that's, that's cool. Um, and so I, so I went to Hawaii and the funny thing there, and I've never talked to another Marine that this has happened to, um, but I get to Hawaii in my unit three, three, they had just deployed to Fallujah like a week before I got to Hawaii. So now I'm in Hawaii and I'm thinking, well, I'm going to be here while they're gone. I'm going to be in Hawaii for like eight months. That's pretty, you know, sweet. Uh, well, then like two weeks later, I check out all my gear and they send me to, to uh, Iraq, right? By myself. I wasn't with, so I wasn't with anybody. So this is, so I fly from, yeah. So I fly from uh, Hawaii to California from California to uh, Bangor, Maine, and then from, from Bangor, Maine to Kuwait, and then got on a, in a convoy from Kuwait to our, our fob out near Fallujah. And so, but that whole trip, it was the craziest trip ever. So I was in my camis. I didn't have a rifle. I just had a sea bag. I was in my camis on commercial flights, which Marines don't fly on commercial flights in their camis, but that's what I did. Uh, I was so new. I didn't know what I was doing. And we, I get on the plane in Maine to go to Kuwait and the plane was filled with like Middle Eastern, you know, folks, right? Like going home, you know what I mean? So they had, they had the, the whole get up, the, it, all of it. And so I was scared to death. <laughs> I, was, uh, I was scared to death. We get to Kuwait. I didn't sleep mm -hmm. the entire flight. It was crazy. We get to Kuwait and I, now I get off the plane I'm walking around, I can't read Arabic. I don't know, I can't talk it, can't speak it. So I'm walking around the airport in Kuwait and I felt like it, I was in the middle of a war zone, which I wasn't because Kuwait was, right? Kuwait's a total green zone, but that's what it felt like. So I'm walking around this airport and I don't know what to do. I don't know where to go. It was like just wild. So I find a big pile of sea bags, just, in the airport and I'm like, I'm gonna sit down on those sea bags and just wait. So I sat there for a few hours and finally some Marines found me and like, you know, got to where I was going. But that was like my first trip to Iraq. Isn't that wild? I have never heard, yeah, by yourself. I have never heard anything like that in any military story. I know, That right? is so <laughs> out of the ordinary. And you were how old at that point? uh 19 um yeah i wouldn't have even been 20 yet wow that's a that's a first deployment story i've never 
that's crazy. Um, yeah. And so when you, you know, as, as how long, then how long were you there and how did you find, how did you, how did you get your bearings? <laughs> I mean, so it just like, uh, I, it's just quick adapting and overcoming and just like, like, um, we, we got to where we got to our camp, you know, um, I got to meet up with our squad and everybody. And like, it was from that point on, it was all good. Uh, just a regular deployment. Um, our unit was there for seven months. I was there for like five and a half. Cause I, I was late. Right. Um, and, uh, we got back from that deployment and, um, of course I'm still drinking. Right. I'm not, uh, at this point I'm not struggling. Like I'm drinking, I'm an alcoholic, but I'm not struggling that the alcohol is not negatively impacting my health. Right. I'm still top PT scores, like top range scores. I'm still crushing life, but a full blown alcoholic at 20. Right. Um, and then we deploy again and we deployed to Ramadi and this deployment was very different than that one. Uh, it was a normal deployment deployed there with my unit, all the things, normal deployment. And we lost, uh, we lost a Marine, um, to suicide, our saw gunner, we lost him to suicide the first month we were there. Uh, and so, and I, I, suicide sucks, whatever, which way you look at it, like suicide just sucks. Was that, would you say, was that your first exposure to losing someone to suicide? First, yeah, first like personally, yes. So my, I have two uncles that were in the Marine Corps that I, I met and I know, and I had a good relationship with that did take their life as well. Um, but I, I wasn't like there. Right. So yeah. this was my first, um, in, encounter with it other than knowing about a family member that did it. Right. Yeah. Which is still very traumatic, but okay. I, I understand that's. Yeah. And, and so, so I don't know what the military trains folks on any nowadays, but mm -hmm. back when I was in and probably every year before me, and maybe even some years after me, suicide, responding to a suicide is not something that was trained on, right? Like we train on, uh, uh, you know, um, responding to, uh, uh, you know, wounds inflicted in combat, you know, trauma, uh, tourniquets, sucking chest wounds, your buddy's got, buddy got shot, right? Like those mm -hmm. things you train on and you get so good at it, you can do it without even thinking about it. Um, but responding to a suicide is not something that is a box that gets checked in training. At least it wasn't then. And so that impacted, I know it impacted more than just me. Um, cause it, a few of us, we heard the gunshots. He took his life with his machine gun, a 240. Uh, so it wasn't like a little bang. You know, it, we were all sleeping and woke up and heard it and then responded to it and found him and the, the situation. Um, and then we had a memorial service and then the and then the deployment carried on. Right. And then six months of the deployment. It's like mm -hmm. it's almost like, yeah, you know, Spencer blew his head off. Uh, we got a mission tomorrow. Everybody get some sleep. You know, it's like, yeah, it wasn't exactly like that, but that's what it felt like. Yeah. Uh, and when we got back from that deployment, that is when my addiction got super dark, like, like so, 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 so bad. And, you know, I, I don't know, and I'll probably never know, and it's fine. I don't have to know, uh, what caused it to be dark this time. Maybe it was, I'm at that point in my life where I've drank too much and now shit's going to get dark. Yeah. Uh, or maybe it had to do with the combination of, uh, the two deployments and then the suicide and, and not processing it. Right. Like maybe that had a part in it. I don't know. I, and it really doesn't matter. But what matters is like, that's when it got dark, got home from that deployment. And, uh, and of course they ask you, right? Like, 
when you come home from deployment, they ask, is everybody okay? Does there, is anybody struggling with mental health? Does anybody struggle with suicidal ideation? And it's like, no, 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 because I don't want it in my record. I, I want to go home on leave. Like I want to go see my family. And if I say I'm struggling and I want to kill myself or I'm struggling with seeing my buddies, you know, uh, head blown off, uh, then yeah. they're not going to send me home. Now I'm going to be stuck in a hospital or, or like all, all the things, right? The stigma sure. starts. Yeah. So that, that transparency is not encouraged through just the, the, the chain of events that follows if you are, if you are vulnerable enough to say you're struggling. Yes. It, back then, I do think now though, um, uh, it's kind of a good little piece to throw like warrior's heart in there really is like what we've seen um what we've seen over the years is a big increase in uh active duty service members being able to reach out and get help whether it's through our program or even another program out there or a program that the that their base prefers to use or whatever that the they are able to say I need help and then their treatment teams are sending them to get help and they're returning back to their base fit for duty and ready to continue their service so we have seen it is different than when I was in where it was like no you don't say anything in fact when I got out of the Marine Corps I was such an alcoholic um that I would have kegs in my barracks room so that I would have enough beer for the weekend. Like I would wake up in my own piss. Uh, I like my own vomit. I would fight my friends for no reason. Um, it was bad. And the only thing, the only, and I'm not pointing blame, I'm just saying the only thing that they did was they sent me to an hour long alcohol awareness class uh as a part of me getting my dd214 and getting out of the military like that was it and i still have the certificate i still have the certificate of when i attended marine corps alcohol awareness 101 and that was my substance abuse treatment when i got out of when the military were, and you were already drowning yeah sinking yeah yeah wow well that the story that your story relates um, and hits so hard because as I was going through and reading more about what you have been through that we I, I want to get to um, that statistic that says that we lost, you know, seven, we've lost 7,000 uh, veterans post 9-11 in combat, but over 30,000 to suicide. Yeah. And I know that is a statistic the American public does not fully grasp or understand. And I, in my opinion, there's just not enough out there in the public to help people connect with how staggering that statistic is and how heart-wrenching and heartbreaking because for the level of service and the, and the price that our veterans have paid for you know, American freedom and our way of life, I just can't stomach that this is the best we can do. And so when I came across Warrior's Heart and saw the work that you guys are doing um, and how I want to hear more about how you came into contact with them through your story, because these are the stories that are so resilient and uplifting and people can believe that we can't, you know, that's my mission with Be Better is just how, what are the little incremental things that we can do to connect with each other and to be better for ourselves and to create better relationships as family members, as community members, as you know, business leaders, parents, however we show up in the world. And I think that your that veterans are at the forefront of being able being able to set that example because the things that you guys have been through, I mean, if you guys can get through this stuff, the rest of us, you know, we're all struggling with something. But that example and understanding how strong we are as as human beings comes through in your story. So um, you know, I thank you for that. And I, I do, I just want to hear more about what, what um, Warrior's Heart does for veterans um, and that addiction process that is so prevalent in, in our veteran community. 
So, you know, um, can you tell me more, just tell me more about, you know, how you ended up connecting with Warrior's Heart and, and, and what you guys do to help yeah. it, help it be better. Yeah. So that's, that's just super cool. It's just, and it's a God thing for me. It's just all, uh, call it what you want, God, higher power, whatever you believe in, but like, it's all, it was all, um, a God thing for me, how everything, even, even my time in the Marine Corps, even my time in addiction, even my time today on this call, like it's, it's just all, uh, it's all from above for me. Um, so I, I got out of the Marine Corps uh, and I struggled again with addiction, alcohol, and then it switched to drugs. And I started using drugs, Xanax, methamphetamine, cocaine, like just all the things I was just, I was trying to kill myself without consciously like saying, I'm going to try to kill myself today. Um, I was just doing it at first slowly and then it started to escalate. And so, uh, in 2000, in 2010, I got out of the Marine Corps and I was in a, a DWI car accident, literally like a month later, I, um, pulled out on the highway and I was rear-ended by this elderly lady. Okay. Um, completely, I was not even conscious. I don't know how the vehicle was even moving. It was, it was that bad. Um, and, and so I wake up, my truck's totaled, the cops are there, all of it happens, the, it's on the local news, like it, it, was a, it was bad. And I wake, and then I wake up again in the hospital and I wake up in the hospital, I'm wearing like a paper gown, I got stuff in my arms, I don't know what happened. Um, and then I got up and I walked out of the hospital. I took everything out of my arms and I walked out of the hospital and, um, a year later, and it did it. So a week later, it didn't take long. A week later, I was back drinking. Like, it didn't take long at all. You know, so I nobody, nobody came and found you after you walked out of the hospital. Nope. Um, no, okay. I got uh, about almost a year later, I got a postcard in the mail, an orange postcard from Bear County um, with a, um, I can't remember if it was a warrant or a court date. It was one of the two. Um, either way, I so that so I went to court, right? And what I found out in court was um, the the lady was okay, like she was okay, um, and she had had a son that just got out of the Marine Corps as well, and he was struggling with addiction and PTSD, and the judge wanted to press charges on me for the accident. I was drunk. I had cocaine in my system, alcohol in my system. I, they could have put me away for that. But this, this lady, angel from above, she refused to let the judge press charges on me. Um, and so I ended up getting a couple months of probation and had to, had to pay a very small fine. Um, and that, and that was that. But that wasn't enough to change me or change the way I was thinking or anything. So my addiction carried on mm -hmm. and then it switched to even more drugs and it just carried on. 2013, my son was born. I thought that was going to change me. Didn't change a thing. Uh, in fact, the day after he was born, uh, he was put in the NICU for uh, just some breathing things. He was he was fine, but they they wouldn't release him. Uh, I left the hospital. I went to the bar and I got drunk. Oh, I could have stayed at the hospital, right? Yeah. Uh, but I didn't. I I didn't. I left the hospital. Uh, went and got drunk, um, and and I I thought that having a kid, my own son, was going to change. Was going to change me. I you know I was going to be sober. I was going to be a good father. I was going to be you know a, a, the man that God created me to be. Like I was going to raise the best the best son in the world, all of, I, I, I really wanted those things, but I, but I didn't do them. Right. I just didn't do them. Yeah. Have and, you, ever, have you ever connected that feeling of wanting to be that guy? Right. And I mean, I believe it, like, obviously you're here today. So you've, you've dug deep and you've done a lot, a lot of work, but 
that belief that you can be that and connecting that to a sense of self-worth to me so many times in these stories and i mean i can say it personally like believing that you can be that better version of yourself do you don't do you believe that it comes back to a, a sense of self-worth absolutely um i've done a lot of work around uh self-concept self-worth self-esteem self-image self-ideals and you you do once i start once i believed that i could become and that i was capable of becoming everything that i everything good that i wanted to be once i believed that then i was able to start to work towards that but until i believed that i was even worthy of that it was it was seemingly impossible to make any progress towards those goals i would wake i would go to i would wake up hungover and say i'm never drinking again i'm not going to do it i don't need alcohol i don't need to wake up in my own piss i don't need to wake up wondering if i hit somebody or killed somebody or uh you know screamed at my kids or like i don't need to do that and then four hours later i'm at the freaking ice house picking up a six pack of beer and it's like how can somebody tell themselves those things at, at eight in the morning and then be drinking beer at noon like that's a problem and it comes down to a, a lot of times uh for me it came down to i didn't believe i was worth a penny period I was worthless and that's the life that I was embracing. Mm -hmm. So how, how did you, how did you begin to change that, that story for yourself? It, it happened, uh, it happened when the court system finally had enough of my BS, we'll call it. Um, and, uh, I, I ended up I ended up in court um, for I was on probation. I ended up in court, and the judge I, they wanted to send me to prison for eight years. I was drunk, and I didn't pull over for the police until I was ready to pull over for the police, and it was about twelve minutes after they were trying to pull me over. So it was not a good situation. Uh, not proud of it at all, what, like whatsoever. It's just what it was. Um, and so I was in jail with an unbondable warrant. I went to court. The judge offered me eight years in Texas penitentiary. I went, I, I declined that, asked for a reset, right? I went back to my cell. I prayed for the first time in my adult life, like really selflessly, like, prayed um and then i started to bargain with god <laughs> and i know you shouldn't do that but i i was i started to bargain with god and i was like lord like eight years like i'm not a bad person i want to change i believe i can change i'll do three years if you can if i can go back to court and the judge offer me three years of prison i will i'll sign i'll sign on the i'll sign on the sentence i'll smile about it and i'll do my time with joy that's what I'm going to do if I if I can do three years instead of eight years. And my son at the time was three years old. Um, I go back to court and the judge asked me if I was ready to sign a three year sentence to prison. And so at that moment, you had never heard you hadn't heard that number before that. Mm -mm. Nope. OK. All no. right. No, I just came up with that number. I was being manipulative a little bit because I knew two years is a minimum. Uh, I don't want to just ask for the minimum because that's not like, you know, like any, everybody's going to ask for the minimum. Like you got to ask for something. So anyway, it's, that's what I was, that was my bargaining with God, right? Like I'm not going to ask for two, but three. Anyway, I had yeah. never heard that from anybody before. I just prayed about it. I asked for it. I went to court. The judge offered it. I didn't even tell my attorney. Like that's just what the judge offered me. And so that's when I knew, one, that um, I was not alone, mm -hmm. uh, period. I, that's when I knew I wasn't alone. And that's when I finally, in my adult life, made a tough choice with, with full commitment to see that choice through. Like, I signed on the paper, 
I went back to I went back to my cell. I called my family. I let them know that hey, I just signed on three years prison. I love you guys, and uh, you know I appreciate everything I've ever done for me. Mm-hmm. And like that's where it was. And then I went off to prison, and things changed for me so drastically during that time in prison. Wow. Crazy. So was it the solitary? Was it, was it, did it feel like a moment in time and everything changed or was it more of a, you know, an evolution during what you're there? So there was, there was one night, uh, there was one night that I remember, uh, I had this dream and some things happened. It, it was just really powerful. But when I woke up from this dream, like the next day, I f- just felt different. I, I felt different. And I knew that something was not the same. And, uh, and then I started to, I, I started to read my Bible. I started to teach Bible studies. I started to read my Alcoholics Anonymous big book. I started to teach uh, big book studies with other alcoholics and drug addicts that were in prison. And so for two years, I spent the entire two years teaching and mentoring myself and other people about uh, faith and Alcoholics Anonymous and getting sober and changing their life. And uh, I did that for every day for two years. It was just like what else is there to do besides pull-ups, push-ups, and teach people about becoming better? And at first, I felt like I had no merit to be doing that because my whole life I had been an asshole. Excuse, sorry, excuse my language. No, it's all right. And, <laughs> uh, you know, and that, that concept of not being able to show up for yourself, right? I mean, it, it <clears throat> over and over again, and then yet you know, we all have a point where, you know, the rubber meets the road and, you know, you never know when that moment's going to come. Right. And this sounds like that was, that was, this was that moment for you after all of these, you know, the missteps and the stumbles and that's, that's the human process. And it's so imperfect, but to get to that point, like I always say, you know, we never know how many chances we're going to get, but amazing when you get to that chance and you, you make the right choice because yeah, the the human process is just, it's imperfect. It it is, you know, I, my mom, my mom told me that my entire, my entire adult life and, and, you know, young teenager uh, life, she was continuously praying for my safety. Right. And she told me when I got out of prison, that the only time I felt so freaking bad. She told me that the only time that she felt that that prayer was answered and that I was safe was when I was in prison. Is that? Yeah. Yeah, My heart, my heart as a mom, my heart breaks for your mom. I'm so glad you are okay. And doing what you're doing today. Cause I, yeah, my heart, I've thought of that as you're talking just to, to, to lie in bed and worry about your kid, no matter what the circumstances is, it's the worst. And, you know, it's, it's like, we go through it with you yes. and yeah, she sounds tremendous. Yeah. She's a rock star. Um, but that's, so, uh, I got out of, so I got out of prison, uh, you know, in 20, 2018 and I knew, I didn't know how, but I knew that somehow I was going to be able to use my past to provide for my family to help other people and to make a difference in the world. I, I wanted to do the, I wanted to do those three things. And, um, and I knew that my past was going to be a way for me to do that. Uh, so I get out of prison and I start going to the gym. Uh, I'm going to AA meetings. I'm going, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm sober. I've been sober two years and I, Back in 2018, Warrior's Heart was uh, a lot smaller than it is now, but we were taking, they were taking our warriors across the street to the CrossFit gym and uh, doing CrossFit class at 4.30 in the afternoon. And so I was remodeling houses and I went 
and I started going to the 430 class uh, at the CrossFit gym out here. And I, I remember seeing, you know, Warriors Heart t-shirts and a bunch, like a big crew of guys coming in there and working out and like, and I, but I didn't know anything about it. And I'm from Bandera and I knew there wasn't a treatment center here. This is a small country town. Like, okay. Yeah, it's not a it's a, it's not a big town at all, um, and I know this town. There's no way there's a treatment center here. Well, there was. It opened up the year that I went to prison. Is the year that Warriors Heart opened up. Wow. Yeah, and uh, the owner, founder, uh, one of them, Josh Josh Lannon, he was taking the guys to the CrossFit class, and he, I don't know the ins and outs of how he heard about me or all those pieces, but, um, he offered me a job based off of what he heard about me and the fact that I was a Marine Corps veteran. I had deployed before I've been to prison and I was sober. Those were like the, the qualifiers, if you will. Uh, and it was super funny because I had an ankle monitor on, I was on parole. I didn't know what I was doing. I was sober and that's where that was. Um, and I didn't even tell you this, but when I got out of prison, I found out I had another kid, my daughter. So I have two kids. I went to prison with one kid and I came out of prison and found out I had another kid, my daughter. She's beautiful. Her name is Madeline. And uh, so, so now I'm at the gym. I have two children, right? And yeah. uh, uh, they offer me a job. And I'll never forget when I came in for the interview, the first interview was really good. And then they asked me to come in for a second interview. And that's when I was like, yep, here it is. They're, they're going to tell me like, Hey, mm, not, a, not right now, but, and, uh, his wife, Lisa, she's a retired uh, police officer out of Vegas. And they had my arrest record on the table. Right. And when I walked in and I saw that my heart sunk and I was like, man, Hey, that's when I felt like this isn't it and you screwed yourself and it's going to take a long time to recover from the life that you were living. Right. Mm -hmm. And she asked me one question and one question only. And she, the question was, do you have a problem with law enforcement officers? Because I've been in so much trouble uh, my record would show like maybe this person does does have a problem. Uh, and she asked me that because we serve police, fire, EMS, EMTs. We serve that warrior mm -hmm. community here. So she asked me that. And uh, I responded to her. I said, no, ma'am, I had a problem with drugs and alcohol, um, but that's all over now. And then they hired me. And I've been here ever since. I started off... Uh, Started off on the admissions team, answering the phones, the crisis phones. And, uh, uh, and, uh, over the last five years, like we've, it's been, it's been a beautiful journey. I'm the admissions director. Now, um, I have a wonderful team here. We've served almost 2,500 warriors. Um, yeah, since 2016. So it's like 2,500 veterans active duty military police officers emts firefighters 2500 of those folks have reached out to us and wanted help right like yeah. they wanted to come they wanted to change their life and me and my team get to be the ones to answer the phone to help get them here it's it's amazing that's incredible but and it takes a it takes a lot of courage to make that call um you know when you're in crisis what and to be the guy on the other end of the phone and you it's a 24 7 hotline correct yeah our so. team our team is rocking and rolling 24 7. um we had so a warrior can call anytime day or night and they'll get a live person on the phone um and uh we'll help them like i tell people you you mentioned this a little bit like how strong we are mm -hmm. and uh we, me, you, uh, people listening to this call, like we have made it through 100% of the worst days of our life. You know what I mean? Like yeah. 
one where where our batting average is a hundred. There's not one day that we've that we've had that we haven't been able to make it through. As hard as it was, as like we made it through that. So like if we can get somebody on the phone, it's like letting them know like there's nothing wrong with making it one more day. Like yeah. it's just do that. Like you can't say tomorrow's gonna be worse than the worst day of your life. Like you've already made it through those days. Yeah. So like if you change today, my grandpa told me, my grandpa told me this before he passed away when I was struggling. Um, he's a Korean war veteran. Like they would, they were stacking bodies on pallets, sending them home from Korea. Like he's a freaking war dog. Mm -hmm. And he told me, he said, Michael, if you quit doing what you're doing, then all of the bad things that are happening as a result of the things that you're doing will start to stop. And eventually, if you've stopped long enough, then they will stop. And it's like, wise old man, right? Yeah. And now I, today, those are words of wisdom. How did it, at that point, did it, did it hit you? You just weren't ready for it. It made, it made sense. Yeah, it made sense, but I just just wasn't ready for it. I wasn't ready to make that change. Uh, I needed I needed a set of consequences and an intervention uh, from my my higher power before I was ever going to make a change. Uh, those two things had to happen. I had to have I had to have some serious consequences uh, that were more than going to jail for a week. Like that yeah. stuff didn't bother me one bit, you know? So, and well, then, and then when I, when I started to learn, or when I started to work on, on like positive affirmations, we teach this to our warriors. We do a process, it's called SAVERS. It's actually a really good process, but it's an acronym, SAVERS, and the S stands for silence or meditation, right? The A is for affirmations. Uh, self affirmations, right? I am a good father. Um, the V is visualization. So like visualizing the affirmation coming true, like you don't have to believe it, just see it, just, just see it. And that's, that's a start. Uh, and then the, and then exercise, reading something and then journaling about what you read. Um, but so that's something we teach our warriors that they can that they can learn here and take take home but it's being able to visualize those things or attributes or characteristics that you want to become like that's one of the things that we focus on teaching our warriors here wow i i love hearing that because you know we are living in a time where you know there's so much there's so much challenge out there among our veteran community and and everywhere else and there is a real cry for help but so often it, and i'm not saying that that you know medicine doesn't have a purpose at some points but the things that you just mentioned people do not realize the saving power of those things and i i mean i i practice those things in my life and it has been an absolute godsend so and i i think you know the more we can talk about those things and make them so much more normal and mainstream and have people realize how powerful they are. You know, it's not to say that medicine doesn't serve a purpose at some point, but those things to me are that grounding force that that really can get you through. And I love hearing that, you know, you guys that you do that because it, it really is super powerful. Awesome. Yeah. Thank you. Yeah, it's awesome. 2,500 veterans have come through since you've been there or in since the inception of warrior's heart yeah since the inception about 2500 warriors uh have have come to us okay. for inpatient training um and uh our goal our mission is to bring 1 million warriors home one and and compare 2500 to 1 million yeah there's a big gap right um what does that mean we've done all kinds of talks about it but what we've determined is uh so like so like me coming home right 
how many lives have I been able to impact just by me getting sober and coming home, right? So just my one life, well, my kids have better lives. My friends have better lives. My, the people I connect with, like hopefully I can bring value to their life, right? So one person can impact so many people. And so it's not about just how many warriors come to our program. It's about how many lives are impacted from a warrior choosing sobriety over addiction and choosing healing over mental health and choosing to change. Because when a warrior comes to our program and they learn how to become a sober, confident warrior, when they go home, they're, a warrior is a servant at heart. That's why, that's why they joined the police academy or the fire academy or the, the military because they're a servant. Uh, there's a lot of them are servant leaders. And when a servant leader can get their head on straight and then go back to their home and serve their family, friends, and loved ones, it the ripple effect of that is absolutely tremendous and you can't even count it. And yeah. so that's what that that's what that means to to us at Warriors Heart, bringing one million warriors home is the ripple effect of what one one person can do. Yeah, I am such a huge believer in that. And I always say like my North Star every morning when I get up is generational learning and healing. And I think the two go hand in hand and, you know, hearing stories like this and, and knowing that there are so many people out there across this country doing hard work that doesn't get recognized, but is so, so necessary. And if you turn on the news, it'll make you crazy. And the reason I started this podcast was to capture stories like this that just don't get told enough because wow. these are the stories that need to be out there and they need to be in the mainstream because there is such a struggle and people need to know there's hope. And I so wholeheartedly believe like, you know, the healing and the process that you're, you've gone through for your family is so inspiring. And your kids are so lucky to have you as their dad. And I know, I mean, I feel it's, it's amazing. I can feel, I can feel how, how passionate you are about that role. And that's, that's my favorite thing in the world. So um, my hat's off to you. And, you know, my, one of the things that I ask everybody that comes on my podcast, because I'm such a believer in hindsight, right? We go through these things that are so challenging because in the end, if we come through and we can help other people. And um, we learn a lot by going through these things, right? So the question I like to ask everybody that comes on my podcast, though, is what is a piece of advice that you could give to your younger self? A piece of advice that I could give to my younger self. I think the greatest piece of advice that I could give myself or anybody even listening is that you, what you tell yourself upstairs does not have to define who you want to become in the, in the here and now. Like I let, I let, my negative thoughts, emotions, uh, all kinds of nonsense. I let it control me so much that the things that I was thinking, I was living out because I, I believed that I was right and they were true. And so the best advice would be just because it's here doesn't mean it's true, right? And like you can choose, we can choose what we listen to uh, and choose what we want to what we want to put out there in the moment from from those thoughts like that is probably the biggest thing it's like we're not we might feel like a piece of trash that day but that doesn't mean that we are right yeah. like I, I tell people too, like give 100 percent all the time it's like well that's you can't do that right you can't give 100 percent all the time because some days you're going to be at 80 percent some days you're going to be at 50 percent some days you're going to be at 20 percent but what you can do is you can give 100% of the 80 that you're at, right? You can give 100% of where you're at in the moment. And that's enough. Um, yeah. So, yeah, good question. Yeah. No, I, I mean, and that, that connects me to something else because, you know, so often when we're in really hard times and I know through the military community, there's such a reliance on our, 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 our resilience, our independence and our, you know, our strength to get through something, but that when we're on those 80% days or those 20% days, to me, that's the time. If you have that self-awareness to know that 
that you are going to go through those swings and that we do need other people. Like we don't have to heal on our own. We need other people and organizations like Warrior's Heart to reach out to because people don't have to heal on their own. And I, I would love to get just your perspective on that before we, I don't want to take too much yeah. of your time, but. No, it's, it's, it's all good. I'm having a great time. Uh, imagine like, imagine how amazing life would be like, just like picture this, right? Like uh, I have a friend or, or, or uh, a spouse or a loved one or whatever. I have a, a battle buddy, call it a battle buddy. I have a battle buddy and me and my battle buddy uh, have a code, right? And the code is, is that at all times we will be at a hundred percent, right? So when I'm at 80, you pick up my 20. You know what I mean? Or when I'm at 50, you you pick up my 50. But when you're at 50, I'll pick up your 50. And so we're always going to be at 100, even if we're not. And like if 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 people were able to get out of that isolation phase and that like I have to do it on my own, I I I don't want to reach out for help. I can't tell I can't tell my wife that I I am struggling with depression. She's going to think I'm weak. Like. If we can learn to effectively communicate what we need, how we need it, and why we need it, and when we need it with the right people, like we can get through absolutely anything at all. The problem is, is that we like to shut our mouth, be so strong and ah, I'm good, like you can't hurt me. But that's the most destructive pattern that a lot of us have held on to for so long. And it's like, that's the culture in the military, especially a police officer. Think about a, a rabbit hole for a second, I guess. But like a police officer spends the majority of their duty solo mm. on their own. You ever see you ever see four cops in a car driving around like, yeah. you, ever, you know, it's it's one cop in a car on patrol. Like they spend their whole job solo. But then we want to we, we, we like. Want to know why a police officer struggles with isolation and they don't want to talk to anybody it's like well, they spend 24-hour shifts alone not talking to anybody anyway that's where they're comfortable so we got to break that like we have to break that stigma because together we can heal yeah i am a huge believer and i can see why we connected i am so happy to hear um you know more about warrior's heart and and just stay in this place of of connection because you guys are doing amazing things that are really really important to america right now and you know we're hurting and i think i do really truly believe it can be better because of organizations like yours so um i want people to know be able to know where to find you so what, what's the best place to reach out and learn more about warrior's heart yeah, so uh, they can get on. We have a it's warriorsheart.com. Um, and there's if you're looking for a job, there's career tabs. If you're a warrior that needs help, there's a contact us tab. It's uh, super convenient name, email, phone number. Uh, answer a few questions about what's going on. Like uh, it's very simple Marine Corps, alcohol, depression. Call me. It's like, cool, we'll, like, we'll call you. If you don't want to pick up the phone and call us, that's fine. We'll call you. There's a number listed at the top of our website, too. Uh, that it'll call. It'll come into our call center. Uh, that any, uh, And I'll send that to you. That way you can post it, right, so everybody can, can see it. Um, and our team is happy. We got a super awesome team. We've, we have uh, alumni on our admissions team that have come through the program and then came back to work and help other warriors come to treatment. We've got uh, first responders, veterans, like our team, the admissions team is absolutely phenomenal. We've got a mom on the admissions team. Her kids are all firefighters. Like it, it's, yeah. we've got a good team and whoever calls will be able to connect with us. And if we're not the program, like, because we treat substance abuse primary along with mental health, PTSD, all those things, but substance abuse is primary. So if someone calls and they don't qualify for the, like, for what we offer, right? Like they don't need a 12-step program. They don't need substance abuse treatment, but they need help. 
We've got a ton of other resources and referrals that we can connect people with to get just PTSD help or or yeah. just brain treatment or just this, like just yeah. give us a call. I mean, everything that you're saying there just it makes me just want to say, like, just reach out. Mm -hmm. Like people suffer in silence and these stories, the ones that we that we don't want to hear, that the, the suicide epidemic that's just crushing America right now. It's always, you know, it's just that make that one phone call and you can, someone cares and people matter and you matter and just, you'll get connected with the right. It just takes that one brave moment to, to reach out. And I thank you for being the people that answer those calls. And I just want to do anything I can to, to, to raise awareness and help people because it just, it, it breaks my heart. And I know that, you know, we all matter and we all make a difference in each other's lives. So thank you so much for what you do and for sharing your story. Cause it's really brave and um, so impactful. And I'm so glad that you are where you are today. And, you know, it's, it's amazing. And so good to hear like humans are incredibly resilient creatures. And, you know, we just, like you say, just keep going one more day. So yeah, thank you so much for, for joining me today. This was really awesome. You're welcome. Thank you so much for having us. And, uh, you know, I look forward to maybe doing another one in the future, yeah, on a different topic or whatever. Yeah, let's stay connected because this, yeah, this generational healing stuff is, it's it's impactful and it's, it, it makes a difference and you're doing it. So thank you. I'm so glad to meet you. This was awesome. And um, yeah, we'll be in touch for sure. And, uh, you know, thank you so much for joining me on what I meant to say today with Michael Odell and Warrior's Heart. And um, I'm Wendy Jones. I'm just here to remind you to be real, be you and be better. Thank you for joining us on What I Meant to Say, another production of Inspired Edutainment brought to you by Be Better Media.